know um, for my thesis project we are looking at um, genome size in, uh, in a variety of different arachnids most of which are going to be tarantulas and uh, tarantulas basically compose almost all of the live specimens that we're working with for this project. In order to get hemolymph, which is tarantula blood more or less, uh, safely from the specimens, we have to sedate them first. So the method that we're using for that is uh, CO2, so carbon dioxide. So basically what we're doing is we've rigged up this sedation chamber, um, which is basically two containers connected by um, aquarium airline tubing, uh, and then we have a, an air pump inside the larger container which also contains the dry ice. So when we plug the pump in, the pump forces the air surrounding it, which because it's in a container with CO2 is primarily CO2, through the airline tubing, uh, and we have a valve here for safety, and the CO2 flows through the uh, tubing into this chamber which we will put the um, subject to be sedated uh, in, and once they reach full sedation, we can uh, open this up and start uh, working on the specimen. So fully sedated, um, basically if I pick this up and I move it around a little bit, if she can't right herself, then she's out of it. This is the this is the Subfosca. This is one of my personal favorite Postlotheria species. We're going to be taking a, a hypodermic needle and making a really tiny little incision in the thinnest part of the exoskeleton, which is on the underside or the ventral side of the leg joints. Um, we make a tiny incision. We touch a slide to the hemolymph that the little bead of hemolymph that bubbles up, and then we close the incision afterwards by using a little bit of super glue, which was originally intended to be used as an emergency situation for bonding human skin together in cases of wounds, but works excellent for, uh, uh, works equally well for tarantula exoskeletons and closing their wounds, and yeah. And then we wait for them to wake up afterwards. So there's a number of um, biological properties that correlate with uh, large or small genome size. So for instance, a maximum metabolic rate can be greater the smaller the genome is. If it's a smaller genome and there's less genetic material inside the nucleus of the cell, then when it comes to uh, cell replication, you can copy that information and, uh, and replicate the cell much faster than if there's a whole lot of genetic information in the nucleus. It's just going to take longer to copy all that information and so that, um, that places sort of a glass ceiling on the maximum metabolic rate that that organism can possibly have. So for instance, birds have um, very small genome sizes, generally speaking, um, compared with other groups of vertebrate animals. Uh, hummingbirds especially have some of the smallest vertebrate genomes, um, and their metabolisms are off the chart. So there's a number of other things that also correlate, such as um, uh, developmental processes and, and things like that. So, mm -hmm. But uh, figuring out the genome size of uh, any particular creature can sort of give us some clues as to um, other biological functions that might also correlate. So we're expecting to find larger genome sizes in tarantula species that maybe take a little longer to grow or grow more slowly than, um, than certain other species. A faster growing tarantula I would expect to see um, a slightly smaller genome size than, than a slow growing one. But we're not just looking at tarantulas, we're also looking at some other branches of the arachnid family tree. So we're looking at uh, some scorpions, harvestmen, 
So from the Opaliones uh, whiptail scorpions, also known as the vinegaroons, which are from the order Thelifonida. And we are also looking at the Amblypygid order, which contains animals that go by the common name the tailless whip scorpions, or sometimes they can also be called cave spiders. 